Hello class, uh, thank you for watching this uh, recorded lecture. Uh, as you know, I'm out of town uh, this week, so um, I am going to uh, finish up module three on energy bands and carriers today. And I hope that this lecture will only be about um, an hour or so, uh, or less. So last time we were talking about the mobility of popular uh, semiconductors. Uh, this is the slide that we ended up with last time. Before we get to this, let's go over some of the main concepts from last time. Uh, just really quickly. Um, when carriers are moving through, let's, let's jump forward here. When carriers are moving through a semiconductor in response to an electric field, this is ultimately what current is, uh, they are slowed down by the fact that they collide. Okay, with no electric field, when no electric field is applied, electrons are bouncing around the lattice due to thermal vibrations. The only way to turn these off is to uh, uh, bring the system down to absolute zero. When you apply an electric field, as we talked about, the elect uh, electrons move opposite the electric field, okay, but they still collide. So these collisions deflect the electrons in, in different directions, and it basically slows the uh, electrons down. We talked about uh, the concept of mobility. The velocity of the electron is this constant mobility times the electric field. There's two mechanisms of, uh, which slow down the electron. Uh, lattice vibrations, which is called lattice scattering, or lattice impurities, which is called impurity scattering. And we talked about the formula for mobility, which is uh, Q times the mean time between collisions divided by the effective mass of the particle. In the case of the electron mobility, we use the uh, effective mass of the electron. We derived a relationship for the mobility. And then we talked about the two different mechanisms. Lattice scattering is due to collisions between the electron and the thermal vibrations within the lattice. This has the temperature t to the power of 3 halves because more thermal vibrations at higher temperature will increase the probability that the electron will collide with it. The second mechanism was impurity scattering, and this was the deflection of electrons due to columbic interactions with impurity ions. So if this was an uh, n-type semiconductor, we have uh, arsenic uh, atoms within the silicon lattice, and this arsenic atom acquires a positively charged nuclei when the elect extra electron leaves, so as an electron is moving through the lattice, um, this negative electron, negatively charged electron will get attracted to the uh, uh, positively charged arsenic ion, and it will become deflected in, a, in one direction. So this is another form of scattering. This has a temperature dependence of t to the negative 3 halves, because at lower temperatures, there's less thermal vibrations, so the electrons move slower through the lattice. It spends more time near this dopant ion, so there's more time for the dopant ion to exert coulombic forces on the electron, so it gets deflected more. At higher temperatures, the opposite occurs. Now, we ended off with the class on these two curves, so let's go over these again. Uh, since we're talking about temperature, let's do this one first. Now, at low temperatures, we have this problem of impurity scattering, so as we go to lower and lower temperatures, uh, the impurity scattering reduces the mobility. So we have the mobility here on the y-axis, temperature in the log scale on the x-axis. At low temperatures, the mobility goes down due to impurity scattering. It increases up to a certain point at which um, this is a, around room temperature and a little bit below room temperature is the optimal point for, uh, uh, for mobility. And then once we go beyond that, then temp uh, the mobility starts to go down as a function of temperature to the power of negative 3 halves. This is due to lattice scattering. All right, so there is an optimal temperature to get the highest mobility. We also ended up with looking at the dependence on doping concentration. So you notice that in all three of these materials, the mobility decreases with doping. We have doping plotted here on the x-axis. So this is the doping density. It's on a log scale. And on the y-axis here, we have the mobility for silicon, germanium, and gallium arsenide. The mobility is given in centimeters squared per volt second. We see that uh, at uh, doping densities above roughly 10 to the 16th or 10 to the 17th, impurity scattering starts to become more significant and the mobility starts to drop. 
Okay, this is due to primarily to impurity scattering. This is on a log scale, so you can see that the mobilities can drop, you know, by a factor of 10 or more. And this is the case with all three materials. Now, we also notice that the mobility for electrons, mu n, is higher than the mobility of holes, mu p. And this is the case with all three materials, silicon, germanium, and gallium arsenide. In the case of gallium arsenide, the ratio between mu n and mu p is quite large. The electrons have uh, relatively high um, mobility uh, in the case of gallium arsenide, higher than silicon, but the hole mobility is approximately the same or a little bit lower. Okay, so the ratio between mu n and mu p is uh, quite significant in a material like gallium arsenide. In germanium, they're a little bit closer, and in silicon, uh, you have about a, uh, 3x, a factor of 3 difference in the mobility of electrons and holes. Uh, holes have a larger effective mass than electrons. So if you look at the, back at this mobility equation, holes have a larger effective mass, so they end up having a lower uh, mobility. I'm sorry, did I say lower? I meant holes have a larger effective mass, so they have a lower mobility. Sorry for that confusion. Okay, so now moving on, this is the slide we ended up with last time, the mobility of popular semiconductor materials. So these are a few of the more popular semiconductor materials. Here on the left, you're given the electron mobility and the hole mobility. Some of these things we talked about earlier, the uh, silicon, in silicon, the electron mobility is about 1500. This is for no doping or low doping and for, for holes is about 450. There's about a factor of three difference. Now I showed you on the previous slide that the electron and hole mobility depends on doping. So this slide is only showing the mobilities in these materials for low doping or no doping. Okay, so what it's showing is this portion of the curve. Okay, at higher dopings the mobilities will go down. Just keep that in mind. These, the table is showing the mobility for low doping or no doping. Of these materials, you see that gallium arsenide has a much higher mobility than silicon does uh, for electrons, but for holes, the mobility is roughly the same. There are other materials like indium phosphide, indium arsenide that have very high mobilities, and newer materials like graphene have an even higher mobility. I believe it's greater than 100,000 or in that neighborhood. So the higher the mobility of the semiconductor has, they will have less resistance. Okay, because as we found that conductivity is proportional to the mobility. We'll touch on that again later in this lecture. Uh, another advantage of high mobility materials is that they have lower transit times. In a transistor, uh, the electrons transit between the source and the drain. So there's a certain amount of time that it takes for an electron to go from one side of the transistor to the other. Okay. The faster the electrons can travel through the transistor, ultimately the faster the transistor will operate. Okay, so high mobilities are important for high-speed electronics, high-speed digital circuits, also high-speed analog circuits. This is why that you'll sometimes see that um, some of the higher uh, speed materials are used for um, uh, high speed receivers, um, high speed microprocessors. Okay, uh, silicon has, uh, you know, compared to these other materials, relatively low performance. However, silicon is, is used quite often because it has sufficient performance and the economics of silicon, as we talked about before, uh, they make sense. There's a lot of infrastructure for working with silicon materials, so it's less expensive to make silicon chips. Uh, fortunately, a lot of the things that, a lot of the electronics that we have, for example, the microprocessors in your uh, cell phones, the uh, wireless receivers in your cell phones, a lot of those devices are made from silicon. Okay, uh, and um, previously, some of the uh, uh, gigahertz uh, receivers would be made of these other materials, but um, more recently has been shown that you can uh, make those materials out of silicon. That's why 
uh, Wi-Fi chips and wireless chips and uh, uh, these types of uh, uh, these types of functionalities in your cell phones have become a lot more affordable than they were in the past. This chart is from uh, uh, Sing's Electronic Devices and Integrated Circuits. Okay, another concept here that we're going to look at is this concept of velocity saturation. At high electric fields, at large electric fields, the linear relationship between carrier velocity and electric field no longer holds. All right, so let's make a plot of this. Remember from before, we found this relationship. Let me just jump back to the slide uh, just so you remember what we were talking about. We have this relationship. The velocity is equal to the mobility times the electric field. All right, so this implies that there's a linear relationship between the two. Now moving forward to this slide here. Okay, so this is the velocity. This is the electric field. So we would expect that the velocity of the electron would increase linearly with the electric field. So it would look like a straight line like this, a linear relationship given by this equation that we saw earlier. Notice that I just want to make a small note here. We're just looking at the magnitude of the velocity, so uh, just ignore the fact that there's no negative sign here. Okay, so this concept of velocity saturation says that uh, instead of the velocity following this line here, it follows this line instead. So once the velocity starts to reach a certain point, it can't go any higher than that. So it reaches a saturation velocity, which we denote V sat. Okay. So instead of this simple equation, this linear relationship between velocity and electric field, we have just a, uh, an equation which accounts for the saturation velocity. This equation that you see here models this green line that we showed earlier. Saturation velocity is, um, uh, there are some models for it, but it's not as well understood as some of the other phenomena that we've talked about. It is thought to be due to optical phonon generation. And phonon is um, a single vibration within the lattice. You know, like, the, like an electron is a single unit of charge. A phonon is a single unit of vibration within the lattice. Okay, uh, this chart is adapted from a very nice online book uh, from uh, from the University of Colorado. And uh, if you're confused about any of the concepts in this module or any of the ones in this class, really, I, this is a really great reference. I, I highly recommend it. This chart shows velocity saturation in common semiconductors. And this chart is from Singh's book, Electronic Devices and Integrated Circuits. Uh, what we have here on the x-axis, we have the electric field, y-axis is the drift velocity. So it's the same chart as what was seen previously on the previous slide. This is in a log scale. x-axis is a log scale, and so is the y-axis. It's also a log scale. Remember, we use log scales to just show uh, relationships over large, you know, over many orders of magnitude. So this is electric fields between 100 and 1 million volts per centimeter. Carrier drift velocities range uh, over you know, um, uh, uh, 100,000 to uh, 10 million centimeters per second. So let's compare some of these materials. First of all, uh, from the previous slide, you notice that we have this linear region here, and then the uh, velocity saturates. We see this here at low electric fields. Uh, for all these materials, below 1,000 volts per centimeter, the relationship between velocity and electric field is linear. Once we start to go above that, then things start to, velocities start to saturate. Germanium starts to saturate around uh, two or 3,000 volts per centimeter. Silicon goes out a little bit further. It saturates at uh, about 30,000 uh, volts per centimeter. Okay. Uh, and it also reaches a higher uh, carrier drift velocity. So the saturation velocity for uh, silicon is higher than it is for germanium. By the way, by the, way the values are given here. The saturation vol uh, uh, velocity for electrons is about 10 to the 7th centimeters per second for silicon, and it's about 0.6 times 10 to the 7th centimeters per second for holes. That's basically what's shown on this plot here. You can see uh, if we drew a line here, this would be about uh, 10 to the 7th. 
Okay. Now, um, uh, if we look at gallium arsenide, this uh, gallium arsenide, indium phosphide, these uh, compound semiconductors, they actually exhibit an interesting relationship that uh, the carrier drift velocity increases linearly. It reaches a peak, and if we go to electric fields beyond that, they actually decrease. Okay, that is for that is due to effects that we're not going to be talking about in this class, but it's just useful that you know that uh, that they are in fact uh, present. So a, a question you can think to yourselves is compare the saturation velocity of silicon to gallium arsenide and think why gallium arsenide might be better for high-speed electronics. I mean, I have talked about these concepts in the lecture uh, in the earlier slides, but just uh, these are the types of questions that you should know for um, an ex a quiz or on the exam. I will have a number of short answer uh, type questions that are conceptual. And these types of things, it's they're things you either know it or you don't. Or you can you can reason them, you know you can reason some of these things through if you understand the uh, basic concepts here. Okay. So the type of questions we'll have on velocity saturation, um, I don't have any in the homework currently, but these are, uh, you know, uh, calculating velocity saturation based on this equation, and just the general concept of it. Uh, comparing the velocity saturation in different materials and um, you know what velocity saturation why it's important in semiconductor devices okay now we're coming back to this concept of electrical current in a semiconductor again now if we jump up to this slide before I don't want to confuse you all what I'm showing you right now is the same stuff that I showed you earlier. It's, this is just a, a different um, uh, a different uh, picture from, from the book. Same set of equations, okay? Uh, same stuff that's here is also being shown on this slide here. We're just revisiting it. So what are these concepts? If we place a voltage across a semiconductor material, the voltage will create an electric field. This electric field propels the electrons and holes and generates a current. Okay, the electrical resistance can be calculated using the concepts we've derived earlier. Ohm's law, R is equal to L divided by A times sigma. Okay, A is the cross-sectional area, so that would be the area of this rectangle here. The length would be the length of the semiconductor material from here to here. Sigma is the conductivity of the material, and R is the resistance. Now the length is always between, um, you know, the one end where you apply the voltage and the other end where you apply the voltage. That defines the length. The cross-sectional area is the area through which the charges can move, as we uh, discussed earlier. Now, um, if we were to place a voltage across the semiconductor material, this is the plus side. Okay, this is the plus side, and then this is the negative side. The electrons move opposite the electric field, as we showed earlier. Okay. So the electric field is pointed from here to here. The electron motion, I'm sorry, the electric field is pointed from positive to negative. So it's going from this side over to this side. Okay, the electric field is shown by this black arrow. Electrons are moving opposite the electric field. Now keep in mind that in a semiconductor, we have two types of charge carriers. We have electrons and we have holes. So we really have to account for both of them. Electrons are moving opposite the field, and holes are moving in the same direction as the electric field. So both types of charge carriers are active in a semiconductor device. One may be more significant in the other than the other, but we do have both types of carriers. All right, so we do have to account for that. Now, this is the other relationship that we saw earlier. The current density is equal to sigma times the electric field, the conductivity. So now we're going to look at calculating sigma. The conductivity in a semiconductor. All right, the conductivity depends on the concentration of carriers in a material and the mobility of the carriers. The basic formula from before applies to a material with a single charge carrier. Okay, this formula we saw earlier on the slides I just showed you um, where we were talking about. Let's go back to that just so we have a proper reference. All right, you can go back to the previous lecture if you have questions about this. This is where we derived electrical resistance. 
Now the resistance was equal to L divided by Q times mu times A. And we divided mu we defined Q times mu as the conductivity sigma. Okay? Q is the density of charge carriers and mu is the mobility. So let's come back to this slide now. All right, so we have this formula sigma is equal to mu times Q. Uh, Q is the charge density coulombs per centimeter cubed. This is how many charges you have per centimeter cubed of material. The mobility is given in centimeters squared per volt second. This represents how fast the charges move. All right, so remember, basic concept. Connectivity depends on how many charges you have, how fast those charges move. Two things. Okay, that determines the conductivity of the material. Now, uh, this is for a single charge carrier. Okay, so if we're dealing with a metal, for example, the metal has, uh, you know, electrons are responsible for conduction in a metal. And so you can find the mobility of the electrons and the charge density of the electrons. In a semiconductor, as I mentioned, we have two types of charge carriers. We have electrons and we have holes. Their concentrations are give, given respectively by N and P. The units for a concentration are uh, 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 carriers per centimeter cubed. Now each one of these carriers also has a mobility. Electrons travel faster than holes. Ele the mobility of electrons is mu n, mobility of holes is mu p. To find the conductivity of a material that has two types of charge carriers, we can add up the con conductivity contributed by each type of carrier. So in a single charge carrier material, it's just equal to mu times the charge density. In the semiconductor, sigma is equal to mu, uh, sorry, mu <laughs> In a single charge carrier material, sigma, the conductivity, is equal to the mobility times the charge density. In a material that, uh, that has two types of charge carriers, the conductivity is equal to sigma n plus sigma p. This is the conductivity due to the electrons. This is the conductivity due to the holes. The conductivity due to electrons is equal to the mobility. Okay, so we have the mobility here multiplied by the charge density. Okay, now the charge density is given by Q, the constant 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19, that's given in coulombs. That's the amount of charge per carrier, and N is the concentration of carriers. Okay, so N is the electron concentration. The units for that is one per centimeter cubed. Multiply by the, by the elementary charge, Q, this is the amount of charge contained in a single carrier. All right, when you multiply those two together, you get coulombs per centimeter cubed. You get the charge density. So this charge density, Q, is equal to little q, which is a constant, multiplied by the carrier concentration. So sigma n is equal to mu n times q times the electron concentration. Sigma p is equal to the mobility of holes times the constant times the hole concentration. All right, and mathematically we can simplify that to uh, q times this quantity here. When we're dealing with an intrinsic semiconductor, so an undoped semiconductor, uh, N and P are going to be equal to each other. Right? Think back to when we were talking about intrinsic semiconductors. A non-doped semiconductor, you have N is equal to P is equal to Ni. Remember that Ni is 1.5 times 10 to the 10th per centimeter cubed. Now in an extrinsic semiconductor, in a doped semiconductor, an N type or P type, typically one of these terms will be much larger than the other. Okay, this is a repetition of before. Note that the conductivity is the sum of the conductivity due to electrons and the conductivity due to holes. So typically one of these components will be much larger than the other. In an N type semiconductor, sigma N is much greater than sigma P because N is much greater than P. All right, we did some previous, we did some calculations in, in the previous class 
where we found that the in an n-type semiconductor, the uh, electron concentration n is many, many, many orders of magnitude larger than the whole concentration p. All right, so in an n-type material, sigma n is going to be significant, much more, many orders of magnitude larger than sigma p. And in the p, in case of a p-type semiconductor, it's going to be the opposite. Sigma p will be much larger than sigma n. All right, this can help you in your calculations. I mean, it can uh, save you a little bit of time because you only need to find the mobility and the concentration of one type of carrier. If you know that you're dealing with an n-type semiconductor, you don't need to find the mobility and the concentration of the holes. Uh, as I said before, in the case of an intrinsic semiconductor, when n and p are comparable to one another, now you need to uh, uh, do both parts of the calculation. So here's an example of calculating conductivity. So what you're asked to do is you're asked to calculate the conductivity of silicon doped with 10 to the 17th per centimeter cubed phosphorus atoms. Remember phosphorus is a column five uh, element. It's an n-type dopant. Okay, so we're gonna uh, compare it to the conductivity of intrinsic undoped silicon. Then what is the resistance of a one centimeter long slab of silicon with a cross section one by one millimeter? <coughs> Calculate the resistance for both cases. I would like you to do this at home as, uh, as a problem. I'm going to do part of it here for you during the lecture, and I would like you, I'm going to show you how to calculate the conductivity of doped silicon and the resistance of doped silicon, but I would like you to calculate the conductivity of the intrinsic uh, silicon and the resistance of the intrinsic silicon on your own. <coughs> this is a chart from before showing the mobility of silicon and the mobility of holes. So, okay, so to solve this problem, we have to first find the conductivity of silicon doped with phosphorus. Uh, so we have to look that up on the chart. Now in your tests and exams, I will give you a chart like this so that you can find the mobility versus doping. So in the case of doping 10 to the 17th, we can look here on the chart, 10 to the 17th, we go down here and we're looking for the electron mobility. So we look at this blue line. If we go across here, we can see that is roughly uh, uh, 10 to the third centimeters squared per volt second. So there is the electron mobility. Now we know this is an n-type semiconductor. So the electron mobility is going to be, and the electron uh, concentration n is going to be much larger than the whole concentration p. As a result, sigma n will be much larger than sigma p. So we're not even going to bother figuring out what sigma p is. Next we can calculate the resistance. R is equal to L divided by sigma A. Now this sigma is going to be just sigma N. Okay. Sigma N is equal to the electron mobility times the, uh, uh, let me put this in here, one point, uh, the mobility, let me add another step here. So this is going to be sigma n. I'm going to do this problem in real time. So it can be q times mu mobility of the electrons times the electron concentration. Okay. So the length length of the slab of silicon is one centimeter. So we have one centimeter in the numerator. In the denominator, we have 1.6 times 10 to the power of negative 19 coulombs, multiplied by the mobility, which we just found, multiplied by the electron concentration. Now, the electron concentration is going to be the same as the doping. So it's 10 to the power of 17 per centimeter cubed
Okay. Now I'm going to go to uh, uh, Google to find uh, the solution to this. Okay. One centimeter divided by one point six. One divided by Q times the mobility, which is one thousand, times the electron concentration, which is one times ten to the seventeenth, multiplied by the cross sectional area, which is uh, point one centimeters times point one centimeters. Okay and we see that it's about 6.25 ohms. All right, a couple things to note. Remember that we have to use this, uh, uh, we have to use uh, centimeters as the units because our mobility is given in centimeters squared per volt second. Okay, so even if you're given the dimensions in terms of millimeters, remember to convert. All right. Uh, in this case, the resistance was L divided by sigma n. If you have a p-type semiconductor, it'll be sigma p. And if it's an intrinsic semiconductor, or the dopings, uh, doping amounts are, are um, you don't, have, the n and p concentrations are similar, then you have to do sigma n plus sigma p. You have to account for both. Okay, so in this problem, the uh, resistance is 6.25 ohms. Now, the problem also asks for calculating the conductivity of intrinsic silicon. So I'll let you do that on your own. Remember, for intrinsic silicon, you have to do sigma n plus sigma p. You have to count for both and, and uh, uh, when you're doing the conductivity and also calculating the resistance. What you'll find is that the conductivity of intrinsic silicon is much, much higher. I'm sorry, much, much lower than uh, um, than doped silicon than in in this uh, in this case right so your resistances are going to be much larger for the undoped case so this shows you that we can use doping to control the resistance of a semiconductor material okay uh, there's one more topic I want to cover before we um, uh, before I end this chapter and that is to look at the energy band model of drift current. Now, um, I mentioned to you all that uh, during this semester, I would like you to understand semiconductor phenomena, both in terms of the physical model as well as the energy band model. Okay, now we did, you know, we've seen a, a plenty of examples of that. Um, let's see here. Let's go to our notes here. So uh, we talked about various phenomena like um, uh, uh, generation, recombination. This is the uh, energy band model. This is the physical model. So I, there are plenty of other examples of uh, these types of things as well. Now, I want you to understand the different phenomena in terms of both the, uh, the energy band model as well as the... Okay. Uh, in both, I would like you to understand phenomena both in terms of the energy band model as well as the uh, physical model. So what are some of the things that we've talked about? Uh, we talked about generation. Generation, recombination. We 
put down the four carrier processes. that I want you to know for this class. One is generation, two is recombination, three is drift, and that's what we've been just talking about, drift currents, and four is diffusion. That's what we'll talk about in the next module. Four carrier processes. Okay, generation is the, uh, the creation of carriers, Recombination is, let's put this full screen here. Recombination is the uh, annihilation of carriers. An electron recombines with the whole. Drift is one way that carriers can move, and diffusion is another way that carriers can move. Drift is movement. Drift is movement due to an electric field. Diffusion is mo uh, movement due to concentration gradients. So let's put a check here besides these things because we've discussed the energy band model and the physical model for both of these and now let's look at drift and the next module will cover diffusion all right so uh, what is drift current okay we go back to this slide here Let me draw this draw our semiconductor material and example let's say we apply a voltage to it and the voltage has a positive value on this side negative value on this side the electrons move this way through the material the electric field is pointed in the opposite direction all right how do we represent this let's draw the electrons in here all right so we know physically what's happening so this would be the physical model And if we want to look at the physical model more microscopically, we can. We know that there's a lattice of uh, silicon atoms, a lattice of silicon atoms in here, interconnected. All right, and the electron is bumping into uh, lattice vibrations and is bumping into, it's being deflected by lattice impurities. So we have that physical. Uh, we have a physical picture of what's happening. The way that we represent this using the energy band model is as follows. Um, for a piece of silicon, let's draw something next to it just so we have a basis of comparison. If we have a piece of silicon just on its own like this, the energy band model, so we'll look at the energy band. Model. We drew the energy band model and it looks like this. We have EC, EV, all right, EI, the intrinsic level is somewhere in the middle, and then we have uh, EF. Let's say we have an n-type, n-type semiconductor material. The Fermi level will be above EC, so let's place it up here. I, I'm sorry, I said Fermi level is above EC. It's Fermi level is above EI. Okay, so this is the Fermi level. So this is what the physical model looks like, and this is what the energy band model looks like. Now, let's say this is also an n-type semiconductor material. So let's say we took this n-type material that we see here on the right, and we apply a voltage to it. That's what we're showing here on the left. So this is n-type. Okay. Now, a rule for energy band diagrams. If you apply a voltage to uh, a material, that changes the location of the Fermi level. Now, the Fermi level, when you apply a voltage to a material, you are changing the electrostatic potential energy. Okay, this side, the right side of um, the right side of this semiconductor has a higher electrostatic potential than the left side of the semiconductor material. Okay, 
And the way that's represented in the energy band diagrams is by a change in the Fermi level. So instead of the Fermi level being a flat line like this, it becomes a slanted line. Okay. And the way that we draw the slanted line is like this. Okay. So the right side of the semiconductor material is at a higher electrostatic potential than the left side of the semiconductor material. By convention, we draw the Fermi level is lower on the side with a higher potential. Okay. There's a lot of things that come from this uh, come from this fact. So let me finish drawing the diagram first, so it's a little bit clear to you. The diagram is the same as before, except it's tilted. The Fermi level is tilted, EC is tilted, and so is EV. Okay, so I, I explained why the Fermi level is, uh, uh, is, is slanted. It has to do with the different electrostatic potential energies on the two sides of the, um, uh, of the semiconductor. Okay, this slanted line is a way of representing electric field in a semiconductor device through the energy band diagram. So the electric field in this case is pointed from right to left. Okay, the electric field is, um, is proportional to the slope of the energy band diagram. Let me write that down because that's a very important uh, rule. The electric field is proportional to the slope of the energy band, the slope of the Fermi level. and ultimately the slope of the band diagram. There's a lot of concepts here, so maybe it's helpful if I just start from the beginning again. Okay, this is the band diagram. The band diagram tilts uh, when you put a voltage across there. Okay, uh, now there's different ways you can think about this. One, one way is the fact that, okay, you have a, uh, when you put a voltage across there, you have an electric field in the material. How do you represent an electric field in the energy band model? you have to apply a slope to the Fermi level. Okay, so this is one of the rules of the energy band diagram. Secondly, the distance between EC and EF, the distance between EC and EV, that distance does not change. These lines actually run parallel to one another. This is because you still have an N-type semiconductor. You still have silicon. Whenever you're dealing with silicon, the distance between EC and EV will always be 1.12 electron volts. That's a fundamental property of silicon. That's the band gap. The band gap does not change unless you change the material, which we're not. The doping also has not changed, so the Fermi level in relation to EC and EV also will not change. So that's why the three lines run parallel to one another. If EF is sloped, then EC and EV are also sloped. Now another rule let's say let's just add these in here. For a given material, EG is fixed. So the distance between EC and EF is fixed. Uh, now for a given doping, EC minus EF, well let's just say the position Okay, give me a second here, just need to plug in.
Okay, sorry about that. For given doping, the position of EF relative to EC and EV does not change. All right, this is a uniformly doped semiconductor. Okay, now let's interpret the last part of it. Remember that in an n-type semiconductor we have electrons. We have electrons in the uh, conduction band. Okay, EF is closer to EC, so we have electrons in the conduction band. We don't have holes in the valence band, or we don't have that many, because EF is closer to EC. So we've talked about that before. I won't put a separate bullet point here. The point I want to make now is, quite, is just this fact that electrons like to go to the lowest energy state. So the electron will just hop from energy state to energy state and will continue going this way. Okay, just, the electro just like the electrons are moving against the electric field, the way that's represented in the energy band diagram is the electrons hop from state to state. There's this side, the right side of uh, the the right side of the semiconductor has has lower energy states than the left side. That's what's causing the electrons to move from left to right. Okay, so this electric field, the difference in electrostatic potential energy between one side of the semiconductor and the other, that's how we represent that in the energy band diagram. So the electrons moving down the slope here is what we refer to as drift current. Okay, electrons move down the slope. This is drift current. slope of EC is caused by the electric field and then the electrons are moving in response to the electric field. So this electron is also moving from state to state. This electron is also. This is creating a drift current. Okay, and That's what drift current is. Next uh, module we'll talk about what uh, uh, we'll talk about what uh, diffusion current is. Okay, so going back to the slide here, this is showing the same thing. When a positive voltage is placed across the semiconductor, the Fermi level on the negative side is higher by convention. Okay, so that's how you get this bending in the band diagram. In this, uh, in this diagram, notice that this is the positive side and this is the negative side. Whichever side has the positive voltage has the lower Fermi level. Just remember that as a rule of thumb. Whichever side has a positive voltage has the lower Fermi level. So in this case, the Fermi level is sloped from lower to higher. Electrons move from high to low. The electric field is pointed opposite in this case. All right? The current, uh, the electrons are moving from negative to positive, and the current is going this way, and that's represented in the energy band diagram uh, uh, like so. All right, what I'd like you to do on your own is uh, describe and draw the energy band diagram for drift in a p-type semiconductor using the principles that I just uh, showed you. Okay, and this, you know, you could have this question on, um, you can do this as a homework problem, confirm. If you have questions about it, you can confirm with me. I've had problems like this on, on past quizzes or exams. Okay, so just a conceptual understanding of uh, how to draw energy band diagrams for drift current. Okay, so that brings us to the end of this module. So this module has been all about uh, uh, how we generate carriers. Let's go, just to summarize here, let's go back up to this intro slide. So we talked about uh, how electrons are arranged in solid materials. We talked about energy band diagrams. 
we talked about the mechanisms of current flow and along with that we talked about um, things like mobility, uh, resistance, electric field, carrier velocity. We talked about how to calculate uh, carrier concentrations in semiconductors and then ultimately how to calculate electrical currents and resistances in semiconductors. So by now you should be able to do all of uh, homework three and so you should prepare homework three for um, the quizzes that we'll be having uh, after I return from from the trip. So we will have a quiz this Thursday and our exam, which will cover through uh, chapter three, through module three, will be uh, a week from Thursday after I return. Okay, uh, thank you all for your attention, and I will see you all on Thursday. Please do prepare the homeworks. I'll upload the homeworks as well as the solutions and prepare that for uh, Thursday's quiz, and have a good week.